We are beginning a brand new series of messages entitled, This is the Life. Uh, Have you ever been on a vacation, and it was an absolute bell ringer of a vacation? It was one of those uh, vacations, maybe uh, you got to go to Hawaii or some other exotic location, and you got to sit on the beach, and you listen to the water slap along the shoreline, and the scenery was just outstanding. And as you sat back in a chair or or out in one of those Adirondack chairs and you were enjoying it, you uttered those words, this is the life. And you said, I could do this forever. I, I can't imagine ever getting tired of this. Maybe you took a cruise, and after one of the many frequent trips to the buffet, uh, you took in a show, and maybe you was walking along the deck on a starlit night, the, the wind is coming off of the ocean as you're cruising along and you're looking up in the starlit sky and, and you're thinking, oh, I can't imagine ever getting tired of this. This is the life. Or maybe uh, if you're like we're getting ready for the camping theme, maybe your thing is camping and, and that's something that we enjoy. We love to go camping. And at nights you're sitting around the fire and again, you're looking up into the starlit night and it's just all is right with the world. And you go to bed smelling like campfire smoke. And it's like, oh, that is the most, if I could find a cologne that smelled like that, I would get it. Um, It's the most tranquil smell. And you get the best night of sleep. And then you wake up in the morning to the sound of the birds squawking and the sunshine coming in the window. and, And you just, it's like, oh, this is the life. And you get up just so that you can go outside and start another fire and eat breakfast over the fire and eat your meals over the fire and and sit in the lawn chair and read your book or whatever you're wanting to do or take a nap and, 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 oh, this is the life. You know what I'm talking about? Now, maybe none of those has rang your bell, but there are things that ring your bell and you say, oh, this is the life. I could do this forever. If I had the opportunity, I would love to do that. You know, we don't typically say that about living the Christian life. Now, now think about that for just a minute. Why wouldn't we typically, we're, certainly we're glad to be saved, right? How many of you are glad you're saved? Okay, good. But we don't typically say when we're going through the everyday Christian life, oh, isn't this wonderful? And you know why we don't? Remember the series we just came off of? Trusting God in troublesome times. And so just because we accepted Jesus Christ as Savior does not turn our life into a vacation resort. Sometimes it turns it into an absolute chaotic, crazy, troublesome, suffering life. And the average person is not going, oh, isn't, oh, I just want to do this every day. I just want trouble to hammer me. That's not typically words that come out of our mouths. Chuck Swindoll put it this way. He says, though we all have much to be thankful for, the pace and the pressure of life often squeezes the joy from us. Our shoulders slumped and our heads bowed. We find some days or months very difficult to get through. Desperate, we often search for joy in all kinds of ways, acquiring possessions, visiting places, or seeing people. But none of these can provide lasting joy. So where do you find joy? in the midst of a trying circumstance. Tonight, we're going to begin our study of the book of Philippians. And the reason that we are going to be studying the book of Philippians, we just came off of this Trusting God in Troublesome Times series, and it's been kind of, it's probably been rough as we've gone through it because we focused on a lot of troubling things. But yet we're learning to trust God through them. And you're going, oh, can't we just have something uplifting and light? Well, I'll tell you what, the book of Philippians is that kind of a book. It is a wonderful book to study, and that's what we're going to begin with. And so the smartest place to begin studying the book of Philippians is in the book of Acts. That makes sense, right? So in Acts chapter 16, look with me at verse 9. Acts 16, verse 9. And the scripture tells us this, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. 
Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis. And from thence to where? Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things that were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. As we continue to study throughout the book of Acts, here's, if you will, the first convert that we find. Then we get to Acts chapter 16, and uh, starting in verse 19, there's this demon-possessed individual that comes along, and Paul and them, they cast the demons from this individual, and it made the people mad. And the people saw that they had lost income off of this demon-possessed woman, and now they have arrested Paul and Silas. So we get to verse 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So we have Paul and Silas in the midst of of a Philippian jail. In Acts chapter 16, as you continue studying this, we have the Philippian jailer who gets saved. So all of this is where the book of Philippians gets its start. You say, well then, where was the book of Philippians written from? Well, we just have to go to another jail cell. You know, Paul spent a lot of his ministry in jail. He did a lot of his preaching from a jail cell. So you go to the book of Acts chapter 28, and in Acts chapter 28, as you're turning there, one of the things that Paul wanted to do, Paul wanted to see Rome. Now, maybe some of you have wanted to take a, a trip to some foreign location, and you say, oh, I would love to see Rome. I would love to see Greece. Do you want to see it the way Paul did? Because Paul's way of getting there was on a prison ship. It says in Acts chapter 28, verse 16, and when he came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners, Paul being one of them, to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And he goes on to witness to these people. Verse 30. Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Why is this beginning so important? Because we have to understand how the church of Philippi got started and we have to understand how the book of Philippi or when the book of Philippi was written. It wasn't written when Paul was on a wonderful uh, cruise where he was getting to enjoy the buffet table and all that kind of stuff. It was written as he was going to prison, or actually as he was in the prison. There are prison epistles. The prison epistles, Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, and Philippians. All four of those prison epistles are written while Paul's in jail. And the book of Philippians is a book about joyful living. If you could put it a different way, Paul is saying, this is the life. <laughs> Would we be in prison saying, oh, this is the life? Probably not. But Paul was, because Paul was right where he wanted to be. You say, Paul was a captive. No, Paul had a captive audience. And he says, this is the life. Let's take a look at this tonight. Tonight, as we begin this study, we want to look at the first major point, and it's going to take us a couple of weeks to get through this, living the life in partnership, growing up together. Living the life in partnership, growing up together. As we begin this, now let's turn to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and let's read the first four verses. Philippians chapter 1, just put a marker here, Philippians chapter 1, the first four verses, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. 
We want to start out tonight under this main point, living the life in partnership, growing up together. We want to look at the warmth of the greeting. There's going to be four points under this main point. We'll only get the first one tonight. The warmth of the greeting. In the book of Ephesians and Colossians, Paul addresses himself as the Lord's apostle. In the book of Philemon, Paul addresses himself as one who has authority, but that he will just appeal to the good sense of of Philemon. To this church, he says, I'm just one of your fellow servants. This was a warm greeting because in this, Paul doesn't come as an apostle. He doesn't come as authority. He comes as a friend. This was one of those churches, the church of Philippi, where after about 10 years from the foundation of this church to where the church is at now, this is a church that he has such good memories about. When he thinks about the Philippians, when he thinks about that church, it just puts a smile on his face. He can't help but smile. If you was to drop the name of somebody in that church, he knew them and they made him smile. Everything about that church, the fellowship that he enjoyed there, the camaraderie, the the like-mindedness that he found among those those people in Philippi, it brought joy to his heart. You know, this was a church that, as you read through the book of Philippians, there are no major doctrinal issues that are addressed, nothing at all. There's no problem. You say, well, what about Yodius and Sintuki? Okay, we'll get to that in chapter 4. But honestly, that was the mildest of discussions about them and whatever the dissension was between them. And, and there, it, Paul really didn't address the issue. He just told the church, he says, help those ladies. Help them. Don't take sides. Help them. And we'll explain that when we get to chapter 4. So this was a fantastic church. Uh, the warmth of the greeting has three things under it. First of all, joy is a major theme of this book. Joy is a major theme in this book. As we study through the book of Philippians, 18 times some form of the word joy is going to be found in four chapters. And you say, wow, that's a lot. You're right. Every single chapter, it talks about joy. And tonight, maybe that's something that you need, and you're saying, boy, I really need that. Because all the stuff that's going on in the world, it's weighing us down, and it's just, just, I don't know, chewing away at our joy. You say, boy, I need a, an infusion of joy. Good. Philippians is going to help because 18 times joy is talked about. But here's something that we've got to understand. Why did Paul have such a joyful spirit? What was the joyful heart's source? And it's the fact that at least a hundred times, a hundred times in four chapters, some name of the Godhead is mentioned. 18 times joy, but a hundred times the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God, or the Holy Spirit. That's a lot. No wonder that is mentioned. Why is that important? Go with me to the book of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians 5 and verse 22, we are told, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. What's the next thing? joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and then it goes on to name the other characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. The moment that we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit of God comes into our life. He immediately indwells us and seals us and baptizes us in the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit the, the joy, folks, tonight, if you know Jesus Christ as Savior, you may feel tonight a little heavy-hearted. You may not think that there's a whole lot of joy in there. There is joy because the Spirit of God is in you. So there is joy. You just got to let it out. You say, well, I got to find it first. All right. Well, you know, buried treasure is still treasure, right? So we got to dig some dirt off sometimes. And I think life has a way of piling dirt on the treasure. It's there because the Holy Spirit of God is there. So the joy is there. So we've got to get the things out of our life. We've got to dig the dirt off of the treasure so that the treasure can come out. You say, well, what's the difference between joy and happiness? Precept Austin writes this. Joy is a condition, a state of the soul due to being right with God. Happiness is affected by what one has. Joy 
by what one is. Happiness comes from experience of good as distinct from evil. Joy comes from experience from God apart from good or evil. Happiness comes through things outside which stir feelings within. Joy leaps within from God in the heart and soul. Happiness is like the changing surface of the ocean. Joy like the ocean bed, untouched by the change of wind or atmosphere. When you are experiencing this joy, don't forget to tell your face. Smile. How many Christians do you know that you could just look at them and see joy at any given time? You can just, it's like, they, are, are you just always, and we'll th- are you always a happy person? No. But there's joy. And that joy is going to be evident when it's in an individual's life. And when they keep the dirt of life shoveled off. You say, well, how do we do that? All right. Let's give ourselves a little bit of booster shot of joy tonight. Let's pull out some shovels. We're going to do some digging. Because we got to get this stuff off of the joy so that the joy can get out. So go with me to Luke chapter 5. I want to give you several things tonight. Uh, that need to be shoveled away, or, or several things that even can be shoveled on to help bring the joy out. So Luke chapter 15. How about 15? Sorry. You're in Luke. Just go 10 more to the right. Luke 15. Look with me at verse 7. In Luke 15 and verse 7, the Bible says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven, over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Go to verse 10, and it says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Repentance brings joy. In context, we are looking at a lost sinner coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. The joy that is experienced is a joy that is in heaven over the lost sinner that has come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. But do you not think that there is joy in the life of the lost sinner that just got saved? And the answer is yes, because the instant that they got saved, the Holy Spirit came in and indwelt them, and immediately they are infused with the fruit of the Spirit. So one of the purest moments that you have in your life is that moment that you've trusted Christ as Savior, where there hasn't been time to shovel the dirt on top of the things that the Spirit of God has placed there uh, wonderfully at salvation. It is just an absolutely pure moment, and to experience that joy. But then we start living a little, don't we? And we don't always live the purest of life like we should as a Christian. And you remember a fellow by the name of David in the Old Testament. And David falls into the sin of lust, and murder is involved, and deceit, and a whole lot of other things that are involved there. And you remember how that sin weighed on David and the physical disability that that sin brought to him. Not just spiritual, not just mental, not just emotional, but it actually brought physical disability to him as well. Read through the description as he describes what it was like as he was broken. There are physical descriptions of his brokenness there. And he cries out in Psalm chapter 51, he says to the Lord, he says, restore unto me, what? The joy of my salvation, or of thy salvation, excuse me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. He didn't say restore unto me salvation. He had not lost his salvation. He would lost the joy. Christian, tonight, if the joy isn't what it ought to be, sin has a way of covering it up. It's still there, but you've buried it deep in sin. The only way to get rid of that tonight is to come clean with the Lord. Confession repenting, forsaking. That isn't going to bed tonight and going, well, Lord, it's been a bad day. I know I've done a lot wrong, so just forgive me for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. You confess nothing. You confessed absolutely nothing. You say, well, I don't feel any better from that. You're not gonna. Nothing's been confessed. Nothing's been forsaken. Nothing's been dealt with. It is when we deal with our sin and call it what God calls it, And deal with it the way God tells us to deal with it. And truly forsake the sin. He says, 
That's how you get the dirt off. And now the joy can rise to the top. Consider something else. Let's go to Jeremiah 15. Jeremiah 15, look with me at verse 16. Jeremiah 15, verse 16. The Bible says here, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me, what? The joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. In John's Gospel, chapter 15 and verse 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. These things were spoken so that your joy could be full. You know what, Christian? If we're not going to be in God's Word like we ought to be, why would we expect to experience the joy like we ought to experience? we got to be in God's Word. Have you not found that it is a joy to study God's Word? I mean, to, to just have that time sequestered away and to pour into the Scriptures and to let the Lord talk to you. Do you not find that a joy? You know, tonight, if you're going, no, I just, I just don't get nothing out of it, then something is wrong. And I'd back up to that previous point about repentance. How can you not enjoy hearing your Savior talk to you? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand tonight, but don't you enjoy when your spouse wants to talk to you? Just nod your head. Yeah, just, let's just go ahead and make an agreement. Don't you enjoy talking to your spouse? Don't you look forward to the time of day where you can just spend time just talking to each other? You love to hear their voice, right? You like to hear their thoughts most of the time. And you just you enjoy that. And if you're sitting here now, you're going, I just wish they'd shut up. You need counseling. You need some help, all right? We like to hear the voice. Why? Because it is the voice of our beloved. Is not the author of this book our beloved? And is not the Scripture God's love letter to us? And if we don't have a love to hear His voice talking to us, something's wrong. Something's wrong. A person could have themselves convinced they're really saved, but that book doesn't mean anything to them. That could be the issue. It could be the issue that there's sin in their life. That could be an issue. You say, yeah, but sometimes we just go through dry spells. Yep, that's true. We do go through dry spells. The Bible characters went through dry spells, but it was a spell. It wasn't decades long. There came a time where the hunger, the thirst, became overwhelming. You know, I guarantee you tonight, I don't care how much discipline and stamina you got, you might go a day without food, you might go a couple days without food, but eventually your stomach's going to start talking to you. And if you know there's food available, you're not going to be able to help yourself. And if you've been away from it for a while, everybody better get out of your way. Somebody's going to lose an arm. Yeah, I mean, you're just going to go to town, right? Because you're so hungry. You're famished. Wow, what we need today are Christians who are famished and just can't get enough of God's Word. Here's something else. Go to John's Gospel, chapter 16. John 16, verse 24. I don't think we're going to get through all this tonight. That's okay. Lord willing, there's next week, right? And if not, well, the Lord can preach the sermon. It'll be a whole lot better. John 16, verse 24. Jesus said, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive. Finish that out. Answered prayer brings joy. Here's something kind of important, though, for us to consider. The verse is talking about the joy that comes from answered prayer, and certainly there's no doubt there is joy that comes from getting our prayers answered. When the Lord tells us yes, we like that, don't we? But you know what? Think about it. If your kid asks you for something and you tell them yes, aren't they happy about it too? What kid isn't? What's the big deal about being happy because I got what I wanted? How about when we didn't get what we wanted? You say, well, then that's not answered prayer. Would you 
suggest to your kids that if you told them no about something that you didn't answer their question? Is no an answer? That is so frustrating to hear people talk say, well, God's not answering my prayers. No, what you're saying is you're not getting what you're wanting and so you're pouting about it, so you're a spoiled child. Because a spoiled child pouts when they don't get what they want. When mommy and daddy say no, but I want, and they start, you know, that's a spoiled kid. Parents, you agree? Aren't we being spoiled when God tells us no and we pout, snort, snot, sniff, and huff and puff? Aren't we being a spoiled child of God? No is an answer. Did he answer? Boy, there's joy in that. Have you stopped and really thought about some of the things you've prayed about and you just had no idea what, if he gave you that, what that would mean tomorrow, next week, next month, next year? But he begins to show you and it's like, oh Lord, thank you for saying no. Thank you for not giving me what I asked you for. And it's not that maybe at the time you weren't trying to ask selfishly. You weren't trying to ask out of the will of God. You really were trying to be sincere and genuine and scriptural and all that. But God knows best, and he knows the absolute best. And so because he loves his children, he said no. And we need to learn to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for no's. I love that, Lord. Thank you. You're saving me from something. You're keeping me from something. I don't know what it is, but oh, thank you, Lord. When was the last time, uh, what would you do as a parent if your kid asked you for something and they said no, and their reaction was exactly the same as if you would have said yes? They would have wrapped their arms around you. Oh, Bobby and Daddy, you're the best Bobby and Daddy ever. I love you, I love you, I love you. Da-da-da-da-da. But you said no. Would you not look at them and go, what is wrong with this kid? <laughs> You'd feel their forehead, you know. Everybody wants to take everybody's temperature these days. You'd be rushing for a thermometer. Something's wrong with this kid. Wow, if we could learn to wrap our arms around the Heavenly Father when He says no and say, thank you, Father, for telling me no. This is going to be so good to not get what I asked you for. You say, okay, I can, I can see that. But that wait, now that's a different story, right? Because that's not an answer, is it? It's not a yes, it's not a no. It's like when you tell your kids, well, maybe later. <laughs> that's not an answer. Yes, it is. Do you suppose that if God gave us something that we prayed for today, and it's a good thing, and He wants to give it to us, but we're not ready to receive it. But God knows that in a little bit of time, we will. You know what that's called? It's called maturity. If your five-year-old said, can I have a car? (laughs) Well, sure. You would be a dumb parent, wouldn't you? Here's the keys, little Johnny, little Susie. Why wouldn't you give them a car when they're five? You say, for the same reason I wouldn't do it when they're 16. (laughs) Wouldn't you be more apt to help them with a vehicle when they're 16? Or a little older than that, maybe? But not at five. Why? Because they're not ready. They're not mature. They don't have the ability to handle something like that. But when they do, you're more than happy to help them with it because they're ready. When God tells us to wait, He says, you're not ready yet. The time's not right yet. That's a good answer. To give us something we are not ready for would be detrimental. And God doesn't want to bring harm to us. He wants to bring good into our life. And so even that weight, that's an answer as well. And it's a good answer. So answered prayer brings joy. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Fellowship with other believers brings joy. 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Christians, we were made to assemble, not to be dissembled. That's how we were made. We have to assemble. 
the Bible tells us to forsake not the assembly of ourselves together. You notice the Bible never tells us, gives us any instructions about being dissembled, because we can do that just fine on our own. But we're given instructions about assembly. We need fellowship. We need it. To refuse it when there's no legitimate reason, that's sin. I, that's just no other way to cut it. When there is not a legitimate reason to not be assembled, and we choose not to be, that's sin. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 that the more that we see the day approaching, we ought to be assembling ourselves together more and more, not less and less. And yet the trend worldwide is for believers to assemble less and less, to find more and more excuses why they can't be together. Are there legitimate reasons why you can't be sometimes? Absolutely. Absolutely, there are legitimate reasons. Otherwise, there's an awful lot of excuses. You know, even if you're on vacation, you don't take a vacation from God. And there's a lot of folks that'll do that. <laughs> I'm out of here. I don't have to be in church. Why not? You know, one of the greatest things you can do, and I can, I can count on one hand how many times we've not been here on a Sunday because we've been on vacation. And as I was thinking it through, we've been in two different, well, actually, a couple different churches in Kentucky. We have been to a church in Florida. We have been to a church in Indiana. And as we have gone to those different churches, you see a lot of different things. 95% of the time, I think, I would never come back here again. We went to a church in, I can't remember if it was Shipshawana or Middlebury, but I don't know what the address would have been. And it was a smaller version, carbon copy, of us. And I thought, and this was on a Wednesday night that we went to that church. And it was like, wow, this is fantastic. I mean, the, the music was right down the line. The preaching was right down the line. The fellowship was right down the line. I'd go back to that church again if we were in that area on a, on a midweek service. Um, we went to a church when we were in Kentucky one time. Loved it the first time. And we said, we're ever back here on a Sunday. We're coming back. In the course of about eight years, they changed. We would never go back there ever again. Could not believe the difference. What happened? I have no idea. But I can tell you what we saw, what was introduced. When they started introducing the praise bands, they started introducing every translation under the sun, they started introducing the contemporary service, they started introducing all this kind of stuff, it no longer was a church that it was in the past. It was terrible. Um, you got to have those experiences sometimes. It helps you appreciate what you got. It really does. It makes you look forward to going home so that you don't say, oh, I wouldn't care if I ever went home. <laughs> we want you to come home from vacation. Amen? Okay, a few of you are coming back. That's good. All right. Go to Luke chapter 15. Look at verse 5. Here's another one tonight. I'm going to see if I can get through these here real quick. Luke 15 and verse 5. Converts bring joy. In Luke chapter 15, verse 5, and it's the parable of the lost sheep, but the Bible says, and when he hath found it, he layeth upon his shoulders rejoicing. How many of you guys were in the era where you got to be in the delivery room when your child was born? Oh, good, good group of you in here. Um, the other ones are going, uh -uh, uh -uh. You were out in the waiting room. You paced for hours, but you weren't in there. You're going, oh, praise God, I wasn't in there. Oh, don't be so quick to thank the Lord for not being in there. That is an awesome place to be. That is absolutely amazing. To be at the receiving end when your child is born. To see that life come into this world and take those first breaths and give out those first cries and uh, to get to cut the cord and all that kind of stuff. That is something you'll never forget. That is a wonderful experience. There's something even better than that, and it's being present when somebody comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior. That is absolutely amazing. To sit there and to hear them pray and call out to the Lord and ask Jesus Christ to save their soul. For them to confess that they're a sinner and that Jesus is the Savior and to ask Him to save their soul. 
That's the most amazing place to be, to hear that heartfelt prayer. And then to see their face, to see that face for the first time after they've said amen and you're now looking at each other again and to see the face of a newborn. That's fantastic. Sometimes they're squalling too, just like your baby was. Other times you can just see this sense of relief that's come over them and it's just a, a peace that is instantly settled over them. And there's been a couple of times when I've dealt with somebody after they prayed and they said amen, I'm just kind of looking at them and he says, well, and they were without words. And they just took this huge breath. He says, I can't believe this. He says, you have no idea what this feels like to have the weight of sin rolled off. And it's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, a child of God knows what that feels like. And now we've gotten to watch you go through that birth process as well. That is amazing. You cannot walk away from something like that without joy. Um, boy, that just lights a fire. And i tell you what, that will light a fire in anybody's life. I'm going to save the last three for next week and continue with this. This is sharpened enough shovels for tonight. I hope you've written them down. You know, oh, were we supposed to? Yeah. But if not, it'll be online tomorrow or the next day. So remember what you can. Get the shovel sharpened. As you think about the things that we've talked about, though, tonight, these are things that we can be actively doing right now the joy is there christian and i know i know the circumstances of life sometimes have put so many layers of dirt and have buried that treasure deep but christian if you know jesus christ as savior the holy spirit of god is in you and that joy is there it's time to find it again because we definitely are living in a joyless world, and there's a lot of joyless Christians. And it is hard because the things going on in this world have shoveled so much dirt on us since the beginning of the year, really, in our church family. But since March, when everything went bonkers in the world, there's been a lot of dirt shoveled. And sometimes it's like bailing water, your boat's got a leak, and the hole is bigger than the bucket that's bailing, and so it's coming in faster than you can bail it out. And that's how maybe you feel tonight. Rather than trying to bail faster, it's time to plug the hole. You plug the hole by doing these things that God's given us to do. Tonight, maybe... One or two of those has really spoken to you, has rang your bell. Commit it to the Lord tonight in this time of invitation. But maybe you're here this evening and you say, I just don't understand this joy thing, period. I don't know Christ as my Savior. That's why you don't understand what joy is. That's, you understand happiness, lost person. You understand happiness. Because there are things in life that make you happy, and then it wears off, and now we got to go get another thing that'll make us happy, and whatever that thing is that makes you happy, and you lose it, you got to get happy all over again. You know that cycle, and it's miserable. Tonight, it's not about your happiness. It's about joy and having your sins forgiven. That's where joy begins. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed tonight, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you can pray this, and it be your words, not mine, but truly your words, the expression of your heart, the Lord's promise to save you. Pray something like this, Lord, I am a sinner, and I know that, and I know that I'm on my way to an eternity in hell, but I believe Jesus loves me. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe he was buried in that tomb and that he arose again from the grave. And there is no other way to be saved but through Jesus. And Lord, right now I ask you to forgive me. Lord, I repent of whatever it is that you've been using, trying 
to get right with God. Lord, I repent of that. Tonight, I believe the gospel. You are the way, the truth, and the life. I call on your name to be saved. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Have you prayed something like that tonight and meant that? If you have, would you just slip your hand up this evening? Then, Father, tonight we thank you for the joy that we can have as believers in Christ. Paul shows us real joy in spite of being in prison, in spite of the persecution, the pain, the beatings, all the things he went through. He shows us real joy. And it didn't come from his circumstances. It came from deep within. Exactly where it's at in us because of your Holy Spirit. So help us tonight, Lord, as believers in Christ, to hunger and to desire that joy to be free and loose in our life, to let it out, Lord, that others might see the difference Christ makes in us. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.